Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Steve McMenamin. I'm your host for today's event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning, emotions and intelligence in investing, is a subject we last examined in May of 2003. For those of you in the room that day, you may remember Bob Schiller described how people consistently fail to recognize big abstract risks. Uh, the operative word is abstract. Uh, behavioral finance is one of our favorite themes at the round table, uh, probably because we don't buy stocks and bonds, we buy people. Uh, today we'll hear some new insights from practitioners <coughs> rather than academics. I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, Arnold Wood is the CEO of Martingale Asset Management. Arnie is well known for his pioneering work in behavioral finance and other investment practices. Before he started Martingale, Arnie was a trustee of Battery March Management and the head of pension assets at State Street Bank. Uh, as one of the industry's gray hairs, uh, Arnie has been a governor of the AIMR, the chairman of the CFA Institute, and the chairman of the Financial Analyst Journal, as well as serving on the faculty of the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Harvard. Uh, sitting to Arnie's left, Whitney Tilson is the founder of T2 Partners, a firm whose strategy focuses on value investing. He serves on the board of directors of Cutler and Buck, or Cutter and Buck, a public company. Before starting T2 Partners, work, Whitney worked at Harvard with Michael Porter, studying the competitiveness of inner cities and intercity based companies nationwide. He's also led the efforts to create ICV Partners, a private equity fund aimed at minority owned businesses. Sitting to Arnie's left, Mark Strom runs Strong Investment Management, a hedge fund with a global macro strategy. Mark is an old friend of the round table and a pioneer of the hedge fund industry. Mark spoke at our very first session in March of 1995, a warning us away from Japan at that time. And uh, before founding his own firm, Mark was a partner at Kane Anderson where he specializes in non-traditional securities. Uh, sitting to my left, the moderator of the Greenwich round table is Liz Hiltman, uh, one of our original members. Uh, Liz is a partner at Barlow Partners. Before Barlow, Liz invested on behalf, in alternatives on behalf of Dartmouth College, the Common, Fund, uh, the Common Fund, and GAM, all early adopters in the alternative field. We picked Liz to moderate today because she's particularly <coughs> adept at picking managers, um, a sixth sense, if you will. So please welcome Liz as she sets the table for today's discussion. Liz? Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I Googled, uh, I went on to Google yesterday and I looked at and I said behavioral finance and it's, it's overwhelming the, the uh, number of uh, hits that you get and then if you start to download some of these articles, the, the literature is, is tremendous. And then I discovered and <laughs> learned this morning that there's a, a, a new society called the Society of, of, uh, for Neuroeconomics which is the, uh, 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 and I, you can talk to Arnie about joining that if you'd like, but it's um, the, the, the mixture of psychology, economics, and neuroscience. And um, I think what we're going to do today, instead of looking at sort of the academic approach to this, is uh, listen to three uh, practitioners, people who have uh, been in the markets a long time, who have made a lot of um, observations and had a lot of um, um, trials and errors and, and try to give you some perspective on, on how we think about it. But one of the, the um, common uh, words, and we all talk about it, it's in the title of today's uh, uh, roundtable, is emotion. And I'm just curious as to, I think that we all uh, believe that emotion has a lot of, is a dominant factor in how we invest. But I also think that there's, a, there's some thought that if you don't have any emotion, it can also be a detriment to investing. And so I'm curious to hear how the, uh, the panelists are going to uh, talk about this this morning. Thanks. Start with Arnie. Well, uh, time is short. There are three of us up here. And um, my classmate George Will once said that brevity is the soul of wit and also the essence of lingerie. And um, so uh, what I plan to do is uh, uh, give you a peek. Um, <coughs> I picked a couple of experiences uh, and want to uh, tell you how they, in fact, affected my life. Um, but before I do that, let me just say that in the area of behavioral finance, there's more to it than uh, rules of thumb or heuristics or what people call 
uh, shortcuts to making decisions. And um, perhaps my only uh, contribution is to uh, think along the terms of how do people make predictions and how do they invariably get them wrong? Uh, how do people calibrate and think about, identify uh, risk and their own risk perceptions? Um, what are the pressures that are brought upon us in terms of working in groups? Uh, my recent research in the last couple of years has been in investment committees. If you look on Google, there isn't a lot about investment committees or about uh, research on uh, how they make decisions, and they are pretty important uh, uh, people in this world. And the last thing, which now dominates most uh, MBA, um, uh, most MBA uh, curricula, is the area of agency theory, principles and agency. And uh, just to simplify that, gee, my knee is killing me this morning. I don't know what it is. I need a doctor. The doctor is the agent. I'm the principal. The doctor has asymmetrical information on how to fix my knee. You guys are primarily agents. But there's a whole structure of relationships around that, and those are very important. And if I can get to it, I'd like to talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. Um, let me just start with um, a very simple uh, example uh, of this um, uh, issue of predictions. This is a pack of cards, and I'm going to offer you a deal this morning. Um, probably not a lot of money in terms of uh, our business, but uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to win $100. And here's the deal. I'm going to take these cards, and I'm going to hold them in front of you, and I'm going to pull out a card, and I'm going to show you, that's it, that's your card. Okay? Now, you have to pay me a dollar to play this game, but you have an opportunity to win 100 bucks. And most people do this because it's a kind of a 1 in 52. This is pure risk. There's nothing subjective about this. So there's your card, there's your bet. One buck, and we put it back in the deck, and we shuffle, shuffle, shuffle the deck. And if we pull out your card, you win 100 bucks. But before we find out if you win 100 bucks, let's try this game a little differently. <clears throat> in this particular case, I'm going to fan out the cards, and I'm going to say, pay me a dollar on the, on the opportunity to win $100. And I'll walk out to you. I wouldn't necessarily walk out to you. And I've done this hundreds of times with uh, classes and, and groups like yours. And I say, pick a card. The first thing people do is they lick their fingers. They're going to impart skill on this game of chance. And they look at those cards. They're going to meet company management. And they're going to shake their hand. They're going to know everything. So they reach out and they take that card very carefully out of the deck. They look at it. They vest it. They don't want anybody else to know that this is their card. And they put that piece of information back in there. And it's in there. And we shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. At this point, what I do is I ask people who were shown the card, as opposed to touch the card, uh, would you be willing to sell your bet? And about 80% of them are willing to sell their bet at a price. I then ask people who touch the card, would you be willing to sell your card? And in fact, 60% say, yes, at a price, I'd be willing to sell my card. Total break in irrationality. I don't need to tell this group that this is exactly the same game. Exactly the same game, except in one case, you were simply shown the card by somebody. In the other, you touched the card. So we then asked people, uh, OK, if you're willing to sell it, what would you be willing to sell it for? In the case where they were shown the card, they wanted roughly $1.89. To take them out of the bet. They paid a dollar, they take the 89 cents. Pretty, pretty nice little return there over a short period of time. We then asked people who touched the card, what would you like for your card? Take a guess at what they wanted. 250. And this, this is the last testing I did was right after the, the uh, 2000, you know, the 99, 2001 period. It used to be a lot higher than this. It was $6.41. <laughs> but the interesting thing is I separated out MBAs, PhDs, hedge fund managers, and so on, and guess what they wanted? $9.55. <laughs> so, so much for the ability to predict and, uh, and to guess. But I mean, this is a, this is a, a good example, I think, of what they call the illusion of control or the illusion of knowledge. And we all have it, and we're all confronted with much more complicated problems in this world, and we all think we have this great degree of accuracy, and we're very confident and optimistic about our own ability to do these sorts of things. The second uh, example that I want to tell you about happened to me when I was at State Street Bank. I just joined there. I was, came out of tuck school. I went in. I, uh, they asked me to cover the auto industry. I went out and I shook the hand of company management. I had a thud factor report that was so thick, you know, bang on the table. They say, this guy, you see, the more you show them, the more they think you know what you're talking about. So I showed them this report, and um, they listened very intently. And of course, they're all in. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, sweating bullets because it's my first presentation in front of 
the investment committee of the bank. And these guys are all my age, except they're wearing vests then. And so, so I basically finished it, and um, the group uh, sort of listened very intently, as I say, um, and suddenly the pressure was on. And the chairman said to me, he said, Mr. Wood, this is a fine presentation, very, very thorough, and I'm, I'm, but, but we're not putting Ford on the list as you recommend, which, so we're not going to put it on as a buy recommendation. I said, yes, sir, and w what's the issue? He said, well, my wife drives a Ford and it doesn't work. <clears throat> this is a law of small numbers. This is taking irrelevant information and building a generality out of it. It's probably one of the single largest things that we do that is improper. And I basically said, excuse me, but don't you want to know more? Don't you want to know that they built 960,000 cars this year? And in fact, your wife got one of the lemons and they're probably 3% lemon rate. <coughs> it made no difference to this man. And you know something? That's when confirmation bias kicked in. That's when everybody around the table said, oh yeah, I've got a neighbor who owns a Ford and it doesn't work either. So everybody kind of conformed in this little circle of the chair. Uh, I'm going to digress here for a second because I, wa I do want to talk about uh, uh, committees for a second. Uh, they are really mysterious, um, mysterious entities in terms of behavior. Um, they can really model it. I mean, they amplify all the things that we as individuals uh, uh, do wrong and do wrong systematically. And I would highly suggest that you uh, read a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. Um, and it's a very potent book, but essentially there is a big difference between a crowd and a committee. And this is an important distinction, particularly when you organize your thinking in your firm. The first thing is, is that they, in a, in a crowd, you get very diverse information. Think of the stock market as a crowd, very diverse information. In a committee, you get very homogeneous information. It's all the same. As a matter of fact, in terms of actually expressing unique information, people are very reluctant to do so because in a committee, it's a very sort of uh, socially cohesive group. They don't want to disturb those relationships. The second thing is the way people actually uh, interpret uh, the information that they have. In the case of a crowd, it's very unencumbered. In the case of a committee, it's very influenced. You know, the chair goes, you're saying something, and the chair goes, does one of these. You know, I mean, how does that affect you? It has a tremendous effect on people. The way people dress has a tremendous, the dapper schnook syndrome, tremendous effect on the way people dress. I mean, my God, this is a nice tie. I mean, I got it pulled up this morning. I'm looking pretty good up here. Okay, get my picture taken. I mean, I'm pretty dapper, you know, and I want you to think I know what I'm talking about. And the last thing is, is that the way that it's aggregated is very important. How information is actually aggregated, it's done very internally on a committee and it's done externally uh, in a in a uh, in a crowd formation. This is why in the millionaire, you know the the movie, uh, the not the movie, but the the uh, Regis Philbin thing, uh, the millionaire. And this is quoted in the book. This is why I think you should read the book. And I'm I'm drawing heavily from this book because it's it has <coughs> had an influence on my thinking in terms of committees. The fact is that in a millionaire, you get if you don't know the answer, you get three choices. You can there are four choices. You can drop two and pick, get a 50-50 shot at the next one, presuming you know nothing. Okay. Two, you can call an expert who you've prearranged, or you can ask the crowd. The expert, it goes from 50-50, one out of two, that, since you eliminated two of the four. The second thing is, is that you can ask an expert. They get it right about 64% of the time, and a crowd gets it right 91% of the time. Now go figure, now think about that. What is the information that you would like to have that you can create a crowd to give you that information that nobody else has? Think about it. How about an over and under betting on analyst estimates? Does anybody have that bet out there? Do you know where that bet exists? I don't. I know there's an IR exchange, and it's fascinating to watch presidential elections. I mean, they got every county right. Every damn county. Not just the states, they got every county right. So ask yourself, can I create a market that represents a crowd that will give me the under and over on analyst estimate. Boy, would I love to have that information. I've actually talked to them about creating that and funding up a, a, that, but the problem is they won't let me have the information alone. So that's, that's an issue. Um, how, how much time do I have here? I'm, I feel like I'm really gabbing here. I'm all right. Okay, I'm all right. I'm still looking dapper up here. Um, 
the thing that we know, and this is a, this is a study I did with John Payne. John is John at the time was the dean at uh, Fuqua, which is the business school <coughs> too. John and I did this study. Uh, it was kind of a survey study of pension funds, endowments, and you know those types of institutional accounts. We did not do individuals. We did not do family, um, you know, family groups. But what we discovered was very interesting. 85% of the members were white males over 55 on the investment committees. 15% were women. There was no one under the age of 30. And 5% were outside of our culture, like an Asian. Now, Asians are very interesting because they think of what's good for the group. Americans think about what? How do I distort this thing so it's good for moi? OK? So it's an entirely different look at things. Women, I, I, I presume that you realize that women are very different from men, okay? They're, they're, they're much more pessimistic. You can read uh, Terry O'Dean and, and Brad Barber's material on women, but, or look at the uh, blood, blood, Liz was alluding to this, but the blood condition of women. They, they are generally pessimistic. They eat about 20% more bread because carbohydrates make you more optimistic. Okay, women are very interesting. Uh, from, <laughs> from many different angles. But anyway, that's, I'm digging in here. But, but anyway, the, the whole concept is, I mean, think about the Wizard of Oz, okay? And I, and I draw this uh, from somebody who's helped me understand small complex groups, Brooke Harrington at, at Brown. She talks about, you know, the Wizard of Oz. I mean, look at those guys. I mean, Ray Bol I mean, you got Ray Bolger and, and, and these people, Burt Law, and they're, you know, they don't have a brain, you know? They've got no courage. And here's Dorothy, who's there, and they're trying to kill the witch, and they're trying to find the Oz, and, and they do everything. And they even get back to Kansas. A group of four that is very diverse is better than a group of 16 that are exactly alike in terms of solving complex problems. I mean, this is a very important. That if they're non-correlated in terms of sources, <laughs> in terms of sources of information, get back to crowds, sources of information, you're going to get much better results. The other thing that's wrong with committees is, is that there are a lot of free riders, what we call social loafers. Uh, you know, if you tug, of, it's very interesting, if you have, have a tug of war, people will pull 100% if they're pulling by themselves. They pull about 93% if they're two people. It drops way down into the 70s if they're three. And if you get to six people, which is the average size of the committees in this thing, they pull less than 50% of their own power. Because there's no connection, they think, between what they do and the outcome. So you have this sort of social loafing, and the, and the trick is, not to be cute here, but how do you te teach, how do you take social loafers and turn them uh, into Nikes? And this is, the, this is the interesting part. You have to give people responsibility on these committees. Number two, they have to be prepared. A strong minority who's very prepared for a topic can run the majority right off the table if the majority is not prepared, by the way. That's a very, I think that's a very important point. You have to allow dissent, and it has to come from the top. I know in our firm, people love to disagree with me, and I'm, I'm totally permissive about that. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. And so dissent, and read Sunstein's book, um, Cass Sunstein, excuse me, Cass Sunstein's book on dissent. It's really, it, it explains why the United States is the way it is. And external brainstorming is the way you do it. In other words, you brainstorm ideas outside the meeting, not within the meeting, because again, you know, somebody's doing this or making funny faces at you when you come up with an idea. You do it outside, and you have them submit a piece of paper when they come in. So they're committed to their thinking on the subject. And the other thing, which is really important, particularly in the investment management business, is keep track of the decisions. Because if you don't keep track of the decisions, you'll never be able to identify the systematic errors you make. This is a business in which we cannot learn from our errors. We never have and we never will. Weathermen learn why? Because they get accurate, fast information. OK, so do bookies. But there are very <laughs> few people in this world who can learn from their predictions in a hurry and understand why and how they may have made a mistake. So, and the other, and the other issue is loss aversion, and we can talk about that later because I am flattering on. Uh, can I tell one last story? Or I, or am I, okay, sure. <laughs> this has to do with uh, the, the whole principal and agency issue. Um, in 1981, <coughs> for those of you who were around then, remember that interest rates were very, very high back then. And I was, uh, you know, cruising my computer and basically discovered that there were 200 and some odd companies on the database then that had had no ec return on equity for like five years. And some of you I know are consultants in this room and can remember me at Battery March coming around saying, look, I found this really interesting group. They're all companies that are going to go broke and I think we ought to invest in them. And the fact is, is that it was called, we called it corporate recovery. It was a nice euphemism. They needed to recover, that sort of thing. So I went down, I was managing money for Solomon Brothers and Engelhardt at the time, and I went down, and, and you used to sit in this incredible room where you sat down, but it was like a, 
like an amphitheater where you sat down below and they all had these high back chairs and they, and this is Milton Rosenthal and David Tenner and all these guys, you know, Jefferson, these guys were controlling the world markets, particularly the commodity markets at the time. And basically, I, I posed this idea, and I said, look, we're only going to put 10% of your account in here, and we're not going to buy any more than three-tenths of 1% in any particular, we're going to buy lots of names. We're going to play the law of large numbers. We're going to, we're going to buy all of these things. You know, sort of like a John Templeton buy anything that's under $2 or whatever, however he started. They said, absolutely not. They went right to their agency role because they were like patriarchs for the pension fund. They did not want us to do this. They were afraid that it would be a big error and that they would get a lot of publicity. So with my tail sort of between my legs, I walked to the elevator, I got out there, and who's standing at the elevator but these three guys? And you know what they asked me? How do I get this stuff in my account? How do I put it in my account? Warren Buffett doesn't give a damn what you think about what he's got in his, in his portfolio. He's the principal and he's the agent. They're both the same. And having written a paper once about, uh, you know, why managers manage their money differently than their clients, I mean, I really, um, you know, I really, this thing really caught hold on me in, in terms of the way people have to sort of transpose themselves into, and this takes a lot of communication with clients, obviously, but have to sort of transpose themselves into that whole concept of how people perceive risk and think of people as, as agents and not worry about what they call onlooker disease. Onlooker disease is when somebody watches you do something you tend to do worse. Remember growing up and your parents would look over your shoulder and get real nervous? I mean, Tiger Woods is a very good golfer. He can hit a three iron, you know, 260 yards or something, right to the middle of the green. By God, if I got up there and I had a crowd of 200,000 watching me hitting a three iron to a green or my driver, okay, I'd, I'd, I'd heal it right into somebody's throat on my left. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a real, that's another issue, which is who's watching you and why? You know, the Boston Globe all over Jack Meyer. I mean, they were unmerciful. So those are my three stories, and they do have to do with predictions and, and and the preferences, the risk preferences, and they do have to do <coughs> with the pressures that are put upon us in committees and how committees uh, can do a better job. Uh, they're terrible at logic, by the way. And the whole principal and agent thing, which is very good to think about the structure relationships, particularly with your clients. So uh, that's my, that's what I woke up thinking about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is the first time I've ever given this presentation um, to anyone but stock pickers, um, the business I'm in. Um, and as I sat here uh, you know, preparing uh, this presentation, thinking, well, how might it be different from people who are allocating money to people like me? And um, as I went through the, the, the main behavioral finance traps, I realized it's all exactly the same. There's, there's really almost no difference. Um, so, um, so my main challenge this morning is to condense a talk I usually give in one hour down to 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll talk fast, and uh, I'll just try and hit, hit the highlights. Um, by the way, a copy of the slides that I usually present the one hour presentation on are available on your way out. Um, Warren Buffett, uh, as, as is usual, I suppose, for a guy who admires him so much, I think he has the final and best word on, on behavioral finance. He uh, once said, investing is not a game where the guy with the 160 IQ beats the guy with the 130 IQ. Once you have ordinary intelligence, what you need is the temperament to control the urges that get other people into trouble and in investing. Uh, so let me talk about uh, some of those urges and human foibles. Um, that uh, affect uh, people who do what I do, but I think equally affect people who do what you do. Um, one of the, one of the all-time biggies is overconfidence. Um, there are all sorts of hilarious statistics and studies. 19% uh, of Americans think that they are in the top 1% of wealthiest households. 80% um, of students think they will finish in the top half of their class. 80% of drivers think they are better than average. Uh, my all-time favorite is at my fifth uh, Harvard Business School reunion six or seven years ago, one of the questions was, do you think you are better looking than the average classmate of yours? And 86% said yes. <laughs> and, and I always get the cheeky question, where was your vote? And I always take the fifth. Uh, so uh, another, uh, another study as it relates to financial estimates is, I guarantee if we went around this room and I asked you to write down two numbers, your net worth when you die and the average net worth of the average person in this room when, when, when they die. And the ratio there, no matter what group, 
no matter what the numbers are, is always two to one. People think they're going to be twice as wealthy when they die as the average person that they're sitting with. Um, and obviously, that cannot be true. So um, if I've convinced you that overconfidence is, is rampant, um, I can also tell you every study of overconfidence shows that people in the investment business are among the most overconfident of all professions. Uh, doctors are up there as well. Um, uh, is, is, you know, what are the implications of this? Um, and uh, when, you're, when you're in the investing business, when you're ev trying to evaluate a manager, what I think is ironic in the money management business is, is to virtually the only people who go into the business are highly confident, if not wildly overconfident. However, the key to success in the business is humility, I would argue. And the humility to understand that the wisdom of crowds, for example, is, is very wise. Uh, that the market, while is, is prone to occasional bursts of, of, of uh, terrible inefficiencies, is by and large extremely efficient. It's very hard to find mispriced securities. And uh, if you're really good, really lucky, um, you might find one or two a month, maybe one or two a year, Warren Buffett argues. Um, and uh, understanding uh, what, the, what the boundaries of your circle of competence are um, and not straying outside of it. So overconfidence, uh, in summary, as it manifests itself in the investing business, is going outside your circle of competence is the biggest mistake. Um, secondly, um, uh, um, using excessive leverage, trading excessively, excessive portfolio concentration are, are some of the manifestations of overconfidence. Um, so. Um, a second uh, big area is chasing performance. Um, this is, um, um, you know, I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. 10% of all money managers will be in the top 10%. It's, it's a mathematical truism, and 1% will be in the top 1%, and of course money just pours in to the people who over whatever short period of time it is um, are in those top uh, uh, percentiles. Uh, but that's not necessarily predictive. In fact, it's, it's, it's guaranteed. Uh, um, it doesn't necessarily predict future performance. So uh, one of the most compelling studies I've ever seen uh, that, that shows this on a macro scale is a study of mutual funds from 1984 to 1995, 12 very good years in the stock market. The S&P was up 15.4 percent compounded. The average mutual fund was up 12.6 percent. Um, the average investor in the average mutual fund was only up 6.3 percent. And so you might ask yourself, well, gee, you know, how's that possible? It's like if I told you an airliner, the average airliner flies at 30,000 feet, and the average passenger on the average airliner flies at 15,000 feet. Um, and, um, but the, the way this is true, of course, is that people don't have all their assets in mutual funds. They have assets in bonds, in, in sitting in their bank account, in real estate, et cetera. And what this shows is, is that investors, you know, just average American mutual fund investors, pile into whatever's hot right at the top, and then they get burned, and then they pile, and then they take whatever's left of their money out right at the bottom. Uh, so they're investing in tech stocks in March 2000, and then they're selling the 20 cents of every dollar that's left in October of 2002. Um, I've never seen such a study done in the uh, fund to funds world, but I would bet my last dollar that those statistics are equally true um, in, the, in the fund to funds world, if not more true. Um, so um, loss aversion, um, which, um, which Arnie briefly uh, touched on, is another big one. Um, it is one of the hardest things in the world to buy a stock at 10, see it go down to 8, and then sell it and thereby guarantee your loss. Um, same thing in your business. If you invest in a manager, it looks great. The manager loses some money for you. Uh, Philip Fisher once said that more money has been lost clinging to an investment that's declined in the hopes that it will return to the price at which you, uh, it, which you got in so you can exit with your dignity intact than any other uh, mistake that investors make. Um, a simple example here um, might be if you have two six-sided dice. One die has a two on each side. Every time you roll it, you get a two. The other die has a one on five sides and a 13 on the fourth side. That's uh, the six side, excuse me, that's your payoff. Well, the expected payoff of that die is 13 plus five ones, 18 divided by six. Your expected value is three. Your expected value of the other die is, of course, two. So you have a 50% higher payoff with the unusual die. You let people throw those two dice hundreds of times and then ask them which one they, want, they prefer, and the overwhelming majority of people will prefer the die that wins five out of six times but has a substantially lower expected value. So uh, you see that uh, I see this all the time in uh, my observations of your business where the person who compounds at uh, you know, 50 basis points a month with very little variability is far 
far favored over someone who's sort of more volatile over shorter periods of time, but yields a much higher expected value. Um, another uh, uh, foible is commitment. Uh, once human beings commit to something, particularly the more publicly and the more powerfully they commit to it, um, virtually will never change that position, even in light of the most overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Uh, so uh, there's a, a study done of racetrack bettors where they ask a guy going up to bet on the ponies, uh, you know, what are the odds that your horse is going to win? And as they approach the uh, betting area, um, they, you know, the odds on the horse are, say, five to one, and they, they say, they tell the person doing the survey that, well, I think the odds my horse is going to win are four to one, and therefore that's why I'm making the bet, because I get a five to one payoff. It's a good bet. Well, then they survey them a few seconds later, after they've gone up, plunked their money down, and now they're walking away, holding their chit, and now all of a sudden their horse is a two to one odd, odds to win. Nothing has changed. The race hasn't been run yet. But the mere fact that they've now committed their capital, and they haven't even, they haven't, th this gets, this becomes an extremely strong dynamic if they were to stand up and say, I predict, you know, horse number five is going to win. You know, then the odds are one to one that the horse is going to win. Um, so um, you start combining that dynamic with the dynamic Arnie was talking about about investment committees where you're sitting around with your peers and you've committed that this particular manager is going to hit a home run and then the manager strikes out and continues to strike out and turns out the guy's a turkey. Um, you know, the person who made that original recommendation is going to be the very last person on the planet to recognize that the guy's a turkey and a mistake was made. So uh, let, me, um, let me summarize by... Uh, um, by capturing, if you were to boil down the two, the two areas that will account for every, every mistake someone in my business will make and, and yours as well, it's failing to invest when you should invest, and then and the other big mistake is failing to exit or sell when you should sell. Well, what are the dynamics that, that cause those two mistakes? And this is where you get what Charlie Munger calls Lollapalooza effects, where you have multiple factors all piling on top of one another that creates this critical mass that lead to overwhelmingly powerful effects. Um, well, in the failure to buy, what's going on there? Like, if you were to go back and look in your investment career, when something was just a layup, it was sort of obvious, and you look back, you're like, how could I have missed, you know, Stevie Cohen 15 years ago, or, or Jim Simons 15 years ago, or something like that, or in my business, you know, how could I have missed, you know, particular stocks that have done exceedingly well. Um, you go back and you look at the, you know, why did I make that mistake, even if you had all the information, even if all the due diligence checked out, and, you know, it's, it, in hindsight, it was obvious, but you didn't act. Well. Um, there are very, very powerful forces, emotional forces at work that are compelling you not to act. Um, and let me summarize them, and each of these would, would, would I could lecture on for, for, and give you many examples of. But one would be anchoring, um, where let's say you started looking at a manager, looked good, and then um, you know, six months later when you're about to invest, uh, the manager's up 20%. And so now you've anchored on the original price when you first started looking at the manager, or in my case, when I first started looking at a stock, now the stock of the manager has gone up, and I have this regret that I didn't invest back then because it's gone up, so maybe I'll wait till, the, till it comes back down to the price at which I first started uh, looking. Um, another is regret aversion. Um, what I was talking about earlier, what if I invest and then the stock goes down or the manager goes down? Um, another is the status quo bias, enormously powerful effect for whatever the status quo is, not to change it. Um, and, and therefore not investing in a stock or not investing in a manager is, is adhering to the status quo. Another uh, very powerful uh, effect is called choice paralysis. There are thousands and thousands of managers to invest in, thousands and thousands of stocks to invest in. So why should I invest in this manager or this stock today when tomorrow I might be able to analyze a few more stocks or managers and find a better one tomorrow? Um, and then this information overload. Um, um, multiple studies have shown that, that after a certain point, the more information you give someone, it doesn't add any value to the end decision, and in fact can result in a suboptimal decision. Um, but in today's world, there's literally an infinite amount of information you can collect on a particular manager or a particular stock. And again, why would I invest today when I can collect more information and invest with more information tomorrow? So all of those factors are at work compelling you not to make an investment today. Similar factors are at work in why don't you sell once you own something. 
Um, I've already talked about the commitment uh, bias. Um, the status quo bias is now working in favor of maintaining your investment uh, in what may be a terrible stock or a terrible manager. Um, the regret aversion, um, often the reason you're thinking of selling is because it's done badly and you don't want to lock in those losses. You don't want to feel regret that if you sell today, it might go up tomorrow. Um, again, same factors of information overload. You know, have I made a mistake here or do I just need to do some more research and collect more information and maybe I'll make a better decision tomorrow. The endowment effect um, is, is at work as well. And then there's the, the factor of, of vivid recent evidence uh, where people tend to overweight uh, recent information um, and discount things that haven't happened in a while. So for example, when Enron and WorldCom blew up, all of a sudden every investor was convinced that every company in corporate America was corrupt and crooked and, and it was a great time for guys like me because we knew that wasn't the case and we could invest in some great companies that were being thrown out with uh, all the bad companies. So, so in the case of selling Let's say the stock or the manager has done very well for you and has gone up. Well, the vivid recent evidence is, is that you know, every day the stock goes up or the manager every month makes money for me, so why would I sell? Um, similarly, if the manager of the stock has been going down recently, um, at, at that point you'd think, well, gee, it's sort of obvious that you should sell. Um, but then you, then you have the whole loss aversion kicking in uh, on that dynamic. So. Um, you start to add up these five or six or seven factors, and it's a wonder we ever make any decisions. So I'll stop there and turn the table over to Mark. Should I take it personally that there's no... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or is this a wireless mic? I think it's wireless. Is it, oh, good. Yeah, it, it works. works. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I want to thank Steve for inviting me. I, I rem we talked a little bit yesterday about the first Greenwich Roundtable, and... Um, he said there was 125 people there and it was very well attended in Colorado. And I'm thinking, you know, when I was there, there was only like maybe 15 or 20 people in the room. And then I remembered how good the snow was. And that, that was the whole issue. I remember that. But uh, I, I appreciate being back here. And I think this is a very interesting topic for all of us to consider. I'm going to talk about um, sort of a mystery of how, what makes a great investor, what sets them apart, and maybe how you as fiduciaries can understand and see a great investor sort of beyond all the analytics and the analysis that you do. I've got some hand tricks here. Um, uh, Envision sort of two sides to me. On, uh, on this hand, I got Graham and Dodd, these four guys, Graham and Dodd. And on this hand, I've got Jung and um, Freud. Now you might ask, well, what do these guys have to do with each other? And I'm going to try to explain. They all kind of come together in here or in you guys. Uh, sort of a matching of this intellectual and psychological um, aspects. You know, Graham and Dodd representing <coughs> the sort of in, the intellect and the analysis and really a, a sense of consciousness. And Freud and Jung, for those of you who don't know who those guys are, these are um, psych, psych, psycho guys who, um, <laughs> who uh, represent what re represents emotion and unconsciousness and, you know, psychology. And for those of you who don't know Freud and Jung, they had this view of the mind where um, only a very small, they had, was, the mind was this vast enterprise where only a small amount of it was conscious, maybe only 5%. And then there's this big 95%, this vast unconscious mind, which has um, the characteristics of a perfect memory where it remembers all your experiences, all your learning, and it's all sort of stored in your unconscious. And it's called an unconscious because people are not conscious that they have it. It's, it's sitting there, but you're not aware of it. And, out of your unconscious bubbles up into your conscious mind things like intuition and emotions and sometimes you don't understand you know why did I do that you know and it, it's really an, an unconscious impulse you have um, you know I was going to give you an example you know maybe you walked in here and you're looking across the room and you see some guy and you go god I just, just I have a feeling about that guy I, don't, I really like that guy for some reason you don't really quite know what it is you know and maybe he sort of looks like the, the kid that threw a snowball in your face when you were four years old. And consciously, you forgot all about it, but unconsciously, your, your, your unconscious sort of sees this guy and there's something about it. And that's the kind of impulse that keeps coming up. And this is very important to a guy like me who, um, you know, has to make decisions every day. So keep in mind, this side's the intellect and this side's the psychology. Um, I, I sort of think both of these things have a macro and a micro component. The micro component or a lot of what my uh, speakers here are talking about, these sort of, um, I guess I could call them thinking errors, where, <coughs> you know, you unconsciously, or you have these impulses, emo I call them emotional impulses, which kind of 
make you do things. Like, for instance, the whole idea of, you know, taking, you know, as an investor, you absolutely have to take, you know, small losses and let your gains run. But your ego wants to be right all the time. So it wants to be, you know, take a little gain here, a little gain here, a little gain here, a little gain here, and then sort of kind of forget about it and hope that the losses come back. And so from a micro perspective, um, you really have to understand who you are and how to counter those um, destructive impulses and, 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 and understand the, the uh, positive impulses and sort of go with those things. And that's where the intuition comes in. From a macro perspective, there's this topography in the world, or let's say the markets, where uh, all these emotional impulses manifest themselves. And it's very important to understand how those, how those fit together, what those impulses are, you know, collectively. And I sort of call that maybe the collective unconscious in terms of the market. I, got to, I want to introduce one uh, term that I've coined on my way in here, which is uh, <clears throat> what I call the white space. And uh, this is kind of an outgrowth of when I interview an analyst or something like that. I kind of draw this box and I, and I try to explain sort of way, the way I look at things. And uh, I think it's sort of fitting for this group. It's going to be maybe hard for you to see. But basically, I draw a rectangular box. And that's perfect knowledge. If you, ha if you have all that information, you have all the information you to know about, any, about, about the particular thing. Let's say it's a stock. And, uh, but, you know, we can never have perfect knowledge. There's always this uncertainty. The shaded part is the analysis, which represents sort of the intellect. This is the kind of information <coughs> that you can gather. A good MBA can figure it out in a couple hours, that kind of thing. It, and I tell my analysts, you know, if you're a great analyst, you can get maybe another 10% or so by talking to suppliers and really digging in and getting, getting more information. But you're always going to have this white space. And the white space is that uh, the, sort of the uncertainty, the imperfect knowledge. And I think that's where great investors get their edge. It's the intuition about this white space. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a, uh, just to sort of as an aside, when I do this thing and talk to people I'm going to hire, I say, you know, what we're really looking for is, is situations with a lot of white space. And you kind of think, well, why is that? Why wouldn't you want things where you can find out a lot of information about? And the reason is because if, if you have a lot of, if a lot of analysis can get you most of the information, it's probably not very interesting because it's a very efficient security, for instance, and you're never going to get an edge. And where the edge comes is in this white space. So we're really looking for situations where there's very little um, shaded space or where you can do analysis and there's a lot of uncertainty, a very controversial situation. And that's where you can really, you know, make a lot of money um, because really what happens is, uh, you know, Everybody, um, you know, is so uncertain about what's going on out here that the prices reflect that. And there's a temporal element to this whole thing as well, where you can imagine this, this diagram in, say, 1910 or 1920, something like that. The access to information was so paramount back then that if, you know, if you lived around the corner from Andrew Mellon or, you know, Carnegie or somebody like that, you really had an incredible information edge. And you, the people in New York were the only people making money. The people in Iowa didn't have a clue. And so that was very important. And that also, um, maybe in today's world, in some very obscure emerging markets where access to information is difficult, maybe that's an edge. But if you sort of fast forward to the year 2006, you have, um, you know, we're overwhelmed with information. My grandmother in her retirement home in Iowa can get this information in about 15 minutes. So this has now become a commodity. And I think in today's world, what's really important where people really get their edge is what I call the white space. And that's you know, where the great investors have their intuition about things. And this intuition is not a magic um, phenomena. It's really just a collection of all the things that you've, you know, learned, read, experienced, the patterns. Inside your unconscious, I kind of view it as, a, as you know, this massive database or this massive super, supercomputer that's sort of accumulated all this information and you're not aware of it. You're just sort of sitting on it. And part of, part of this intuition is allowing it to, to bubble up and understand what kind of feels good and what, you know, just how to use it, essentially. Um, I have a, an example here, which I was going to give the crowd. Uh, this is a real company. It's, uh, I'm going to allow you uh, perfect hindsight, which you never get, so you better take advantage of it. If, and I'm going to let you go back five years, and I'm going to tell you about this company, and you're going to tell me whether it's something you, you would have bought and are inter interested in. This company is a... Um, a, a classic category killer, extremely well managed. It, it operates in a very, very large fragmented industry, over, and it has great growth prospects. Over the past five years, from if you rewound five years ago, the last five years, it's had um, 
a, con a consistent 22% return on equity. Its earnings per share have doubled. Its cash flows doubled. Its dividend has tripled. The company's bought back about 10% of their market capitalization in the open market, and it's reduced its debt substantially. And you may look at that and go, okay, give me some of that. Look, sounds good. You know, did it, did it, was it up 50%? Did it double? You know, how did it do over those five years? And um, this is a real company, and the name of it's Walmart, and the stock price is down about 40%. And I might ask you, you know, what do you, what, and you might look at yourself, what did I miss? And I think what you missed was the white space that I'm talking about. And, and, you know, kind of through my evolution in this business, um, you know, I was trained as an economist and did, you know, very detailed econometric models. And I was trained in securities analysis and did very detailed security an analysis. And, you know, I've kind of learned my trade based on understanding the fallacy in these things and why they don't work. And most, you know, most economists will tell you these models are all based on rational um, thought and rational individuals. The only problem is nobody's ever met a rational person, and that's kind of what this whole behavioral finance is all about. Um, I got four more people to introduce you to. Um, these are, you probably recognize them, most of them as, as great investors, and I want to just give you an idea of some of the things that they've said. Uh, the first one is John Maynard Keynes. Most of you know him as a good economist, uh, actually a great economist. M most of you probably don't know he had a very decadent lifestyle, but very few people know that he was a very successful investor. And he has a very interesting quote. He said, successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others. And that's probably the most important thing I'm going to say today, so I'm going to say it again. Successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others. Now, you can understand that's a psychological construct. And if you really sort of think about it, that's really what it's all about. Um, there's another fellow I'm going to introduce you to. His name is George Soros. His son Robert likes to talk about George and his intuition, and he says, you know, George used to, you know, go on and on about all this analysis he did on this market, and he made this great play, but he said, you don't understand. He came home, and one day his, his back would be in this huge spasm, and that was his signal that his, ma his intuition was manifesting, manifesting itself in his body, and he was, he was Prone, prone to go out and do something, you know, make a big play in the market, and that's really what it was all about for him. He, uh, if any, any of you have read any of his books, he talks about this reflexivity, which is um, where the, you know, the participants affect the market, and the market affects the participants, and there's this feedback loop, and that's all, again, all a psychological construct. Uh, another fellow that was mentioned is Warren Buffett. Um, we sort of think him as this cerebral guy who, you know, figures out all this stuff and makes billions of dollars, but there was a recent Wall Street Journal article a couple months ago, and I quote from that. He said, I do not use analysts or fortune tellers. If I had to pick one, I don't know which one it would be. Berkshire has no investment committee or asset allocation guidelines, and Mr. Buffett does not meet with analysts or advisors. I think Mr. Buffett uses intuition. Uh, the fourth guy I want to introduce you to is uh, somebody that I knew and worked with earlier in my career who was a very cerebral guy, a very intelligent guy, an incredibly deep thinker who died about a year ago. His name was Leon Levy, and he wrote a book um, which I believe is called The Mind of the Market, something like that. And I'll quote from that. <clears throat> Investing is as much as psychological as an economic act. Even hard-headed types who think they are basing their decisions on fundamentals will discover over time that there are fashions in fundamentals. This, in turn, suggests that fundamentals are not so fundamental after all. Analysts tend to look upon markets as rational and efficient. The outlook is very dangerous for one's <coughs> economic health. <coughs> uh, it is even more dangerous to misconstrue. This is actually very important. It's even more dangerous to misconstrue success in the market for rational analysis and those most adept at profiting from a particular market are often least likely to notice when the game is over and probably the least psychologically prepared to profit from the successor market. And I've kind of based my whole career on that thing because I found that when, you know, a specialist gets involved in a market, you know, he's very good at it, but he never knows when to change. And he's always convincing you that now's the time to be in his specialty. And I've tried to be very flexible around what I do. Um, I have, uh, want to give you some, maybe an example of how we use this at our firm and kind of how we look at things. Um, I guess, first of all, you know, this 
this is very important. The, the analysis, the um, gathering information, the analytics, it is very important. You can't sort of blindly go out and listen to Freud and Young or you'd be, I don't know where you'd be. <laughs> but, um, you know, doing the analysis is very important. And then it sort of starts to evolve into the psychology. You know, you kind of look at a situation, then you, you kind of think, where, where are we in the cycle? Where, where, where did this thing sell, say, in other cycles? What, how is this cycle different than the past? Um, and then you sort of get into the psychology of, um, you know, what are this, what's, what's in the psyche of the participants in this market? You know, what is everybody focused on in this market and collateral markets? Um, what possible influence do, are we not understanding? And we, you know, think about what, what, what are we really missing? And, um, you know, we think about what's the trigger of that maybe to change the psychology. Because what happens, the perfect situation is where, you know, everybody is on one side looking at a situation. Everybody's negative on this. They hate it. And it's so obvious that it's something to hate. And if you can make a case that this thing has some, you know, some merit to it, you know, maybe there's something that not everybody's seeing and you kind of do the analysis on that, where you really make money is the trend of this herd, you know, sort of coming around to your view. And you can get huge trends when you get everybody negative to get everybody positive. And that's what these big trends in the markets are all about. So this understanding the psychology is, is very important. And I'm going to give you sort of one contemporary example, both on the way up and the way down. Um, we've been very involved in the energy markets for the last two years. And if you kind of go back about two years, you know, energy had been in this trading range forever. Let's call let's talk about crude oil. You know, when crude oil starts moving up, it's, you know, whatever, it's 30, it's $35. And Every analyst on Wall Street basically is telling you that, well, is it going to peak at 35? Is it going to peak at 40? You know, when's it going to peak? And, you know, I remember there was the, I don't want to pick on anybody, but there was an analyst at Bear Stearns, and he came out every single week telling you when oil was going to peak. And that was pretty much the consensus on Wall Street for the last couple of years. Everybody was looking for a peak in oil, and all the, all the oil equities were priced that way, like oil's going to peak soon, so you don't buy the, pay up for the equities. And that went on for about two years, and you had an incredible run in, in both oil and oil stocks because of that, because the psycho psychology was set up perfectly. Everybody's looking for a peak, and, and you, you weren't going to lose money when everybody was in that sort of psychological construct. And then um, Katrina hit, and all of a sudden everybody was saying, well, we don't have enough energy. It's, you know, this may be the floor. It's going to go to 100. Goldman Sachs come out with this, uh, you know, super spike scenario where, Oil's going to go to 100, and everybody, instead of focusing when it was going to peak, they were, they were focusing on how high it was going to go, which basically the oil market peaked that day. And, um, you know, on the way up, you had sort of lean inventories. You had, you know, big uptake from emerging economies. China was using, I think they used 15 percent more oil last year than they did the year before. And, you know, then this year they sort of announced, well, you know, our oil, oil usage is going to be flat. And... Uh, and now, now there's so much oil around, there's no place to put it. And so we sort of played it on the way up, and now we're playing it on the way down, where there's literally no place to put the oil. There is so much oil in the world that every tank, every ship, every swimming pool is full, filled with oil. And it, it, it seems like a no-brainer. Now everybody's focused on $100 a barrel on, on the way down. So that's kind of how it, it works in, I guess, my world. I guess I'm going to leave you with um, something that Steve said that, you know, when you buy a manager, you really are not buying the analytics. You know, you can do all your analytics, you can do your sharp ratios and all that kind of thing, but what you are, what you're buying is really buying a person. And I think there's a few questions you need to ask beyond the analytics to these managers. Um, I think you need to ask them and understand how they deal with their own emotional impulses, because we all have them, and some of them are very destructive. Um, do, and sort of ask them, you know, do they know themselves, um, and do they do they understand what impulses hurt and what helps helps them? You know, and are they willing to look at themselves and are willing to change and really understand that? Because that's how you grow as an investor is really understanding yourself and, and what impulses are you know work and what impulses don't. Other other very important thing is in this business, change is inevitable. They're, this is the only constant in this business is change. And can these managers adopt to change? Um, because what you're buying is only sustainable if they can um, adapt to change and harness their emotions. And I, I read the, on the plane here the Greenwich Roundtable um, handbook on how to pick uh, macro managers and CTAs, which probably a lot of you have seen. <coughs> and there was, an, there was an interesting section there about pontificators. And I think that was very right on because so many people will pontificate. And again, 
They want to be right. Their ego wants them to be right. And they'll pontificate forever on something that's going up. Well, it's going down, 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 down. And, you know, they'll, they just want to be right, so they'll hold on to that thing. And it's a very dangerous thing and, and something you need to watch out for when you talk to managers. So I think I'm going to leave you with the fact that it's very important to sort of understand a manager, how he deals with his emotions, how he, how he uses intuition to, to, to measure or to use the, this white space to his advantage. And I guess to kind of turn the white space into a clear space. And um, I think if you do that, you've probably created yourself an edge. And you can ask me any questions you like. Right. Well, with that, shall we open it up for some questions or a question or two? Do we have time? Paul? Can you talk about these, uh, these influences generally? But do you find that there's any heterogeneity in how they tend to get applied at the manager level and the approach level? That particular investment approaches tend to lend themselves to particular area, uh, errors or particular strengths that, uh, that managers who understand themselves apply in order to, to, uh, to try to get advantage in their particular approach. Yeah, I think as, as, as Whitney said, sort of highlight on, there's all <coughs> kinds of these thinking errors, and it kind of depends maybe what you're doing as to what thinking errors or emotional impulses are destructive and what are not. So I think you maybe have to narrow it down to what the guy does, he or she does, and, and what his thinking errors are. I think it may be more important, it's is this person introspective enough to understand that he has these thinking errors, because we all have them, and is he... W will he adapt? Will he sort of work on himself to fix himself? That's gonna, what's going to make him a, a better investor. I'll just echo for, for value investors that are, I mean, we're sort of contrarian by nature. Someone like me is far less likely to fall into the trap of, of chasing the herd and buying stocks, breaking new 52-week highs, because I really only look on the 52-week low list, right? Um, so, so um, but, um, or for example, if I buy a stock at 10 and it goes to 8, I'm a bargain hunter, and if I liked it at 10, all other things being equal, I like it more at 8. Um, the, the, but the trap that I have to be especially careful of is, is all other things aren't always equal, and sometimes situations change, and the information that caused me to buy its stock at 10 thinking it's worth 20 may have changed. Um, and so, so, you know, there are certain areas here that a guy who, who just has the fundamental nature and, and, and approach to investing that I have, you know, some of these traps won't apply at all to me, but others will apply 2x to me you know, relative to other managers. So I'd, I'd hesitate to sort of summarize. I, I think I hit the big ones, and that's, you know, given the shortness of time. If you, if you look at my presentation, there are probably 25 others. Um, and you have to have all the tools in your toolkit, whether you're the manager or whether you're evaluating the manager, and then understand something about the manager to then start figuring out, okay, which one should I really be focusing on and thinking about? The, um, all of this stuff emanates out of what we call bounded rationality. And that's uh, very simply explained is that we really can't think of maybe two or three things at once. And um, as an example, one of the, one of the things that um, crosses all the borders is, here's a piece of paper. If I fold that over on itself a hundred times, in other words, double it a hundred times, how thick is it? Now I just framed you because I showed you the paper this way and you looked at the thickness of the paper. The answer to the question is 80 trillion times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So just compound it 100%, 100 times, and that's what you get. People anchor. You walk into a committee meeting and somebody says, how's the market doing today? Geez, I think it's really lousy. People will anchor on that thought, and you can't believe how it affects their thinking the entire meeting. So anchoring, I think, is where it emanates. People need very narrow frames, very bounded frames, in order to come to conclusions. And this, the concept of intuition is, um, is an, they call it fast and frugal thinking, basically. And you basically use very limited evidence that you, can, you have relied on in the past, in other words, intuitive evidence, to take in, se inherently separable parts, and they come together. It's very simple. What's Irish and sits in the sun? Patio furniture, OK? I took two pieces, two pieces of, of something that had nothing to do with one another, I give a punchline, and that's the intuition. That's where the intuition, the light goes on. So it's, it's the bound of rationality, it's the, our limited ability to think of things, or to, to put things together, that drives most of this thing across all, all borders. And it won a Nobel Prize, by the way, that won a Nobel Prize. As did a coin flip, won a Nobel Prize recently, as you know. 
which is the loss aversion issue. Two to one. You people hate to lose on the basis of two to one. Even bet, 50-50 flip a coin, people want to win $2.21 for every, 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 um, every dollar they, they might lose. Uh, yes, uh, the chair is the chair is is critical. Um, the chair has to to drive the committee. This is a very simple example and one that's uh, is out there. I buy a stock at sixty, I sell it at seventy. Stock keeps going up, goes to eighty, so we buy it back at eighty, and we sell it at ninety. How much money do we make? The typical committee answers that question fifty percent. Fifty percent of the time, they answer it wrong. They say it's ten dollars because we made ten, but then we weren't in it, so we lost ten. But then we made ten. So the way you handle that in a committee, and this is really critical, is the chair has to be totally impartial. They go around this, the room and they say, "Sally, what do you think?" And Sally says, ten dollars because of the, the logic that we just used." Well, Ed, do you? What do you think? I mean, is Sally right or? And I said, "Well, you know, you know." And they talk about the issue, not the people. This is critical. Got to talk about the issues, not the people who made the, the analysis. So, well, you know, I really think it's we made the 10 and we made the 10, therefore it's 20. You can move that number of 50, roughly 50% 50, 50 up to around 85%. God knows why they can't get it to 100. But an impartial chair is critical. My wife owns a Ford and it doesn't work. End of conversation. No discussion. That had, a, that had an indelible impression on me. I mean, it just ended right there. One example, law of small numbers being applied to a 960,000 car a year for Ford Motor Company. So I mean, that, that's, I, I can go into lots of reasons. Actually, um, you know, I have a whole shtick on committees. It's, it's very, um, you know, states call me out and say, gee, we have a new committee, can you come out and <coughs> abuse us again? And basically it is it's a slightly abusive talk, but it is, how do, you, how do you get this thing squared away? How do you have a committee that can make, hopefully better, improve their decision making at least? Maybe not make better decisions, but can improve the process of making the decisions. One more question? Back there. Uh, sure. I just have a lot of just about two ideas. One, I have a quote here from uh, the Senate Bank, which is prospect theory. And it says, uh, prospect theory is a certain pain from a loss tends to be greater than the pleasure of the gain. And can really yeah. that. There's a second issue, which is from a study on investment behavior and negative side effects of emotions to Andrew Carnegie. And it says successful investors are functional psychopaths, like people with brain lesions, because they're unable to feel pain or fear and therefore make better investment decisions. Correct. I guess the question Correct. I had is, having been in the role of a trading desk person, running portfolios with my father, and sitting on an investment committee for a college endowment, I'm curious specifically about time horizon. It seems to be very interesting about yeah. the time horizon that you yeah. address in your different roles and the nature of the thing. And also a question on varying. Can you address it? Yeah, I will. I'll take a shot at it. Um, instant gratification is a big deal. People tend to look over much shorter time horizons than they necessarily should. It's referred to as hyperbolic discounting. And we really want things now. <coughs> and we don't think of things in the long term. I'll go on the diet tomorrow, but I'm eating the chocolate cake now. Okay? I mean, we have those problems. Why should I? The, the government's going to pay me later on. Why do I need to save money? Why do I need to put money away? Today, I want the plasma TV. Buy the plasma TV. What, well, why don't you put the two grand in your IRA? Well, I'd rather have a plasma TV, to be honest with you. I mean, this is a really big problem. And, and you can look at things over different time periods and, and relate those time periods to the nature of the decisions that people make about investing or how they treat their own money or their own health and all of these sorts of issues. I mean, it's, it's a huge area. And I know that people like um, David Labson, and others are working on this. And just to go back to the neuroeconomics, they're also working on that in terms of looking at people's impulses and how, you see, you have an emotional, you know, this is oversimplified, but you have an emotional thing here which you're born with, which is f almost fully developed by the age of two. You know, it's the, the uh, you know, you either, you either stay or you flee type of thing. Then there's a cognitive, and this is why we look at these kids in the Olympics, God, they're doing these things that they're 500 feet in the air and boards and they're twisting around and, you know, because their cognition hasn't fully developed. They don't think about this. They have no, you know, no, no fear. You know, I'm now, a, I'm now a grampy cruiser on skis. I used to do weird things on skis, 
Okay? Now I'm just a grampy cruiser because the cognition has kicked in on me. I don't want to get hurt. You know, I, I don't want to blow a knee out anymore. I mean, that's, that's, I used to do that all the time. So I think you really have to separate the emotional from the cognition. And, and in terms of this issue of long-term, short-term, the emotional thing is dealing with the short-term in most cases, and the cognition is dealing with the long-term. It's just, and the emotion can overpower everything. Walk down a str dark street sometime and have a couple of people approach you. The emotional thing kicks in like that. You can't even think about, you know, how am I going to react to this? What am I going to do? You're just thinking, oh, my God, these guys are going to kill me. We were talking about this last night, by the way. Anyway. I'll just add, I think uh, one of the big advantages we have is, is, is um, our time horizon. Um, if you think about where investors can have an edge in the marketplace, there's six or seven areas. Um, you can have an analytical advantage, uh, psychological advantage, uh, et cetera. I'd say one of the areas where we consistently find that, that we think we have an advantage is, is we're looking out a multi-year time horizon. And the market is very, very efficient short term. It's much less efficient longer term. Bill Miller calls it, um, refers to it as one of his biggest advantages and calls it time arbitrage. Um, so. Uh, um, you know, I'll just give a quick example. One fund of funds that was an investor with us, um, we, we uh, have always written monthly letters to our investors, which is very unusual in the value investing world. Most value investors report quarterly or, or less frequently. Buffett only used to report annually when he ran his partnership. And uh, we started, for the first time ever, we started getting a, an email shortly after the investment um, asking us for how we were doing in the middle of the month and wanted to know what our assets were in the middle of the month. And we're like, okay, we didn't say anything, you know, we're just, we'll keep you happy, we'll send you, if, you, if that's what you want, we'll give it to you. But it was just obvious, instantly obvious to us that anybody who cares about intra-month uh, returns shouldn't, this is just a bad match. I don't know what they were doing investing with us. Um, you know, we try and communicate very clearly, very frequently, you know, what we do, because as Buffett says, if you're going to have a ballet in, in, a, in a concert hall, don't put on the marquee outside rock concert. Okay, that's, you know, you should, uh, and, and vice versa. Either is fine, but, but advertise yourself correctly. Not surprisingly, by the way, that we just got a redemption notice from that investor, and, and uh, we're not surprised. I have a little bit to add to that, sort of in line <coughs> with what I was talking about. <clears throat> I've done a little work with a uh, sort of a psychologist who, who deals with traders, and he deals, you know, with Stevie Cohen and all these great traders. And there are certain personality types that make good investors and good traders I think they have, they have a survey, something like 68% of their people fall into what, maybe some of you know what Myers-Briggs is, it's kind of a, a personality categorizing system and something like 60% of the, the, the good traders or good investors fall into this narrow category and their being, impulsivity is, is, is like a thing you've got to avoid in people in, in, as you select an investor because, you know, they'd had none of them. So there's certain personality types and if you'd like send me an email, I'll send you the studies on that. It's very interesting to see what personality types actually can be good investors and good traders. And it really narrows it down to a, a, a fairly small sample. Go back and read Moneyball and Blink at the same time. Blink, analytics is Moneyball. I mean, it's really interesting to compare. Now, now that you've heard, so, you know, you're familiar with some of this stuff, if you read those two books, you're going to, I think it's a very useful insight into the way people do, do think about things. Great. I don't know if we have time for any more questions. Okay, well, great. I think we're running out of time here, speaking of time horizons, but I'm certainly going to um, take a lot of this information and go back and try to think about how I can uh, uh, learn from my mistakes and, and uh, interview managers better. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Steve and thank the panelists for a thank great uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, Liz, I think you already have that thing called intuition. That's why you're here today. I want to thank you also for assembling today's panel. This is really quite a few very, very useful and different insights that we've had um, non-academic people who are in the market shooting with live ammunition. Um, and uh, uh, once again, I want to remind you that I am not allowed back in the office unless you fill out the uh, scorecard and the feedback card. Susan collects those, and they are the source of um, our feedback for our guests today, our speakers. It, it, they are also a source for our ideas for our programming committee. Um, the way we put together these symposiums is your feedback. It's also um, very much investor driven. Um, Want to make um, a few housekeeping announcements. March 9th, we will all assemble here in this room in the evening for our Founders Council session. The subject is best practices 
uh, due diligence, uh, not necessarily for global macro, but we've, um, we've got three very, very inter interesting people from different backgrounds, someone from the CIA, um, an investigative journalist, and Jules Kroll, the uh, noted private investigator. Uh, that'll be March 9th. Uh, on March 16th, we're going to uh, meet again here in the, group, uh, in the room for another 100,000 foot look at the subject of the demographics of opportunity. Um, <laughs> in um, 2001, you know, we were <coughs> sitting here after September 11, and I've got another of these kinds of announcements to make. Um, as many of you know, Hunt Taylor uh, died tragically in a motorcycle accident um, last Sunday, and um, not this Sunday, but the Sunday before. And I want to read, um, Hunt moderated this symposium in 2003. Let me introduce, uh, let me read to you what um, I said about him. Hunt is the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today. He works for the Stern family. And he's a seasoned veteran in the world of alternatives. And according to Steve McCarthy, Hunt was the male model for Van Gogh's Dr. Gachet. At the time, we had a, an impressionist exhibition here in the room. But many of you know Hunt. Um, he was a very lively moderator. He was a warm person. He, he loved you all. And um, we're planning a memorial service for Hunt sometime in early March. And I, I really want to encourage you all to attend that session, um, or at least attend the memorial and, and pay um, and tell the family how you knew Hunt, how Hunt touched you, because the family has no idea um, how many friends he had out there. The so I really want to encourage you, and I'll, we'll be reaching out to that time to let you know. Um, I also want to thank our education committee uh, for writing uh, due diligence uh, for macro strategies. Spencer uh, Bogus spoke at the managed Funds Association in Florida and give a dazzling presentation. I want to thank uh, Spencer, Nancy, and Ben for giving a tremendous uh, presentation and a tremendous effort in writing this document. It's been, we've been getting great reviews um, by everyone who's read it. I want to thank that committee. Uh, and probably most importantly, and, and um, a real bright spot here, is a um, fellow sitting to my right, Doug Moffitt, is now the president of the Greenwich Roundtable. Doug will be running the roundtable. Uh, from here on in. And Doug, I'm putting you on, um, right. on the spot. <laughs> I don't want to you. Would you like to say anything? I just uh, want to say thank you to the search committee uh, and the board for the confidence that you've placed in me. Um, it's an honor and I'm excited for the responsibility. I look forward to meeting each of you as members are going forward to sit down and really listen to you and listen to things that you love, things that you'd like to see us do, ways in which we can all work to improve and make this a great experience for all of us and continue to grow the round table in the direction that's grown for so many years. And congratulations to the great vision that you've had over the years to what you found in Steve and created, which is uh, quite a testament to quite, quite a powerful process. Uh, so thank you and look forward to being all of you. Thank you, Doug. And, and, and most importantly today, thank you, Arnie, Michael, and Mark. Well done. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. Mm -hmm.